sorry, I didn't hear you ring the doorbell. I was in the shower. Thanks for popping by the compound for this episode of the Chrissy Cast, where I chat to a regular crew of my friends and interesting people from all over the world. Thank you so much for finding me. I'm loving this sick. Now, today you're joining me and the sparkly Jodie Rogers, who I first came to know through her appearance on the delightful Netflix series Love on the Spectrum. She's a relationship counsellor. You know the one. Turns out she's also a qualified sexologist. Ooh la la. Listen along as we explore stories of autism and I float the idea of free vibrators for everyone. Enjoy this chat, Chrissy Casters. Welcome to the Chrissy Cast, Jody Rogers. Thank you for having me. I have I'm very so, excited. I've got so many questions that popped into my head. Uh, when you came on my radio show and there's never enough time to fully go into detail in with all the questions that I've got. Yeah. So obviously everybody fell in love with you on Love, of the Spe- uh, Love on the Spectrum and me and my kids used to just wait for that moment that you would arrive because <laughs> nothing's more relatable than feeling weird about relationships. <laughs> very true. It's very relatable. Can I ask some questions about autism? Um, mm-hmm. Because I feel like you've been working with autistic people for decades. Yeah. But there is still some fear of the unknown around these autistic spectrum disorder things. What is autism spectrum disorder exactly? Oh, geez, that's a massive question. Right. Well, diag- diagnostically, if somebody gets a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, they're really diagnostically looking at two areas where people are, you know, it has to be, it's beyond struggling. They're having great difficulty um, in their day to day lives and they're looking for two parts. So the first part is they're looking at differences in social interaction mm-hmm. or social relationships the reciprocal nature Mm -hmm. of our social interaction and then the other part is what people call repetitive and restricted interests and behavior now within those two areas that i'm talking about though chrissy the diversity of how that presents is so broad and so huge that there's no two people that really present in the same way. I've written down here, are there as many shades on the spectrum as there are human beings? Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. Pretty well. And if you, you know, when we're talking about a spectrum, people get a little bit confused because they think of autism being like a continuum. But when we're talking continuum, we're talking about something that's linear like this along line. So if we're talking about somebody's intellect, you know, somebody said, oh, what's your IQ? That's like a comparison along a continuum. But when we're talking spectrum, we're talking all possibilities. So the way I always think about it is, I don't know whether you ever did art at school, but when I went to school, when we were in school, this art teacher made us do a colour wheel, like all the spectrum of Mm colours. So if you think about the possibility of spectrums of colours, think about them when we're talking autism spectrum, we're talking about all the possibilities of how somebody is going to present. Yeah. But every single person will interact in a different way, their social skills or the way they communicate or the way that they relate to other people will be different than the neurotypical persons. And they will also have areas of their, the way that they think about the world which will be repetitive so that there'll be things like they might really, really love a routine or they might have great difficulty with change or they may have repetitive, uh, what we call motor mannerisms, they might do repetitive things with their body as I'm doing repetitive things with my body right now. Well, just but, you, you know, saying that, I love routine and mm-hmm. you, and I know that you do too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is, I guess, what are the things that you know about yourself Mm-hmm. that you have to honour every day in order to be comfortable and to be you? Yeah, I, what I know is that routine allows for predictability and routine keeps us really, really calm. Mm. So when you know what's going to happen next, it allows us just to move through the day ease more easily. But I'm pretty repetitive in lots of things I do. So 
you know, I definitely have a routine in my day. I, I walk every morning. I really love to swim. Mm. I really like things to be. And if I don't do those things, I know that my mental health isn't that great. But even within that, I've got all these funny little behaviours that I do. So when I walk, I like the walk to either have a destination to it. Yeah. So, you know, if and even if there's no proper destination, you know, if I don't say, I'm going to walk to this place, to that place, I will create a destination. So if I'm walking with friends, I'll say, we've got to touch the gate. Or no, we have to walk till we get to that log. Or we have, you know, I have to have an end point yeah. for me to turn around and come back. And I'm if I same. don't find it, are you? Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. 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 So like I used to get, I used to things. panic when I'd get those, you know, Australia Post slips that say you've missed your delivery. But oh. now I get excited because I know that the next day I can put on my backpack and walk to the post office and I don't have to think about a destination. I know that I've got that. Got one. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I've got one. But I think we've, we all do it. And even when people say, oh, no, I don't have a routine. I just go with the flow. And there's very few people on this planet that are spontaneous every single day of their life. Mm. Nearly, even if it's to the point where people get up in the morning and they have a routine of, I'll get up, I make myself a cup of tea, I have a shower, I brush my teeth. Mm. You know, that we, we do things in a day because it allows us to just go, okay, well, this doesn't – when we have a routine, it means we don't have to use our flexible adaptive thinking. Yeah. It means that we can just go, I'll go through these steps. And if you have a rhythm of the steps, then when something gets thrown at you, you actually can cope with it a lot better because the baseline of your life is that you've got this – system. Would you advise people that are maybe struggling with their mental health to come up with a very basic routine, even if it is wake up, brush your teeth, have a cup of tea, put on your shoes? Do you think that those small measures make a difference in the long run? Massive. Mm. Massive. If we, can you imagine a whole day of nothingness? You know, and I think when we... I mean, sometimes I I pray for a day of nothing. There's bloody (laughs) hell. I'd love it. But But I know what you mean. Yeah, but if you've got a day of nothingness and your mental health is good, then then that's rejuvenation. Yes. If you're struggling with your mental health Mm. and you have an open day of nothingness, that's when you ruminate. Yeah. That's when you get stuck in your own thinking. So, see, what happens is if you establish just these small steps and you actually achieve those small steps that that's really really good for you because Mm. then you can feel like i managed to make the bed today i managed to brush my teeth today i actually got dressed today those things really really help us to actually get through and feel like we're progressing and moving forward if we just spend the whole day and if somebody's got severe depression clinical depression Mm. It is so difficult to even achieve the smallest thing. It Mm. really is. Just Mm. to even to get out of bed is so difficult. But when we just achieve one small part of a routine, it really, really helps us to just progress one step forward and feel better about ourselves. Mm. That's what I know. You've been working with uh, people with autism for for decades, but really Love on Mm. the Spectrum was the first time me and my kids had ever seen people with autism on the screen or really in in real life. Also the term neurodivergency, I'd never heard that until probably about five years ago, if that. So I feel like people are getting more and more familiar with the differences that exist in people that, you know, we share our society with. I want to ask you first up, when people become more familiar with these concepts, as we have been, a sort of casual language starts to emerge. And yeah. I've noticed neurodivergent people and neurotypical people saying things like, oh, you know, she's a bit on the specky or, um, you know, oh, he's got a touch of the tears or like, you know, I'm, I'm a bit neurospicy. Yeah. I don't know if I should feel uncomfortable about this sort of casual terminology or whether it's a great thing that it's becoming so normal yeah. that we're giving it a nickname. 
Yeah. I think the difficulty that what the, the neurotypical community mm. are not understanding or perceiving, like, sure, we can, we banter around like that and might say, oh, they're a bit neurospicy or, you know, oh, that's it. The old days we used to go, oh, that's a bit aspy or, yes. oh, that's a bit of autistic. But there's no bit. If you're autistic, you're autistic. And so I think what we have to realise is, so if I said, um, what's an example that I can give you? Look, you know, at the moment I had somebody even say to me, oh, I've got OCD. Oh, that's really OCD. Yeah. No, 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 that's not OCD. That's just being pedantic or perfectionist. Yes. There's a massive difference than being autistic than being somebody that likes a routine. Yeah. There's a massive difference than being um, a little bit quirky and being autistic. Yeah. There's a massive difference than somebody that needs to move and is hyperactive than somebody that has ADHD. So I think what we have to remember is that, of course, all of us have different quirks. Every single one of us does. Mm. But just because we've got these quirky parts of our personality or just because I might like to have, um, you know, my cutlery in specific places, Mm. that doesn't make me have OCD. Or just because I might have difficulty in... I'm just trying to think, you know, just because I might have some sensory difficulties, that doesn't make make me autistic. Yeah. So I think what we just have to be really, really careful of is that if we banter too much in this, that we don't forget that autism is a disability. Yeah. And if you have ADHD, you are struggling. Mm. You know, it's a, it, I think that we forget when it becomes... Um, too much of just general language that we apply it to ourselves Mm. we apply a diagnosis to ourselves we don't have that diagnosis because all the things we're talking about are people that really really struggle living in a majority neurotypical world so i'd much rather people say you know instead of saying oh i'm a little bit autistic no you're not no you've got components of you that are relatable to autism. Yes. But you are not a little bit autistic. There's, there is no little bit of autistic. Mm. You are either autistic or you're not. I've been. But it's just being able to relate. I've been reading your book. I've got it here somewhere. Where is it? I've been reading your book, <laughs> Unique, What Autism Can Teach Us About Difference, Connection and Belonging. And you're very clear in the, in the forward to say that you are not the voice of everybody who has autism. Absolutely. No way. You, you are just somebody that has been working with people with autism for a very long time and know a lot more than anybody else. Can you, knowing knowing that's the way you feel about your position and your knowledge and your experience, can you maybe share what you think people with autism would think of neurotypical people making their disability more casual and referring to it as a touch of the tears or on the specky? We have to remember that there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of autistic people and every single person's got their own opinion and perspective and point of view. Mm. But what I think that a lot of people, I think that there's many people that I work with that they just don't want people to just banter around something that has had profound impact on their lives. So, you know, there's many, many autistic people that have been isolated, have been bullied, have been left separated from, you know, made feel very different and left out and misunderstood and have not been able to enter into group situations and have Mm. been... Um, expelled from school or have not been able to join in on school. So I think the difficulty is is that if we make too much light of using that terminology, then we might be forgetting the deep struggle that many, many autistic people have had through a lifetime and continue to have. And the other thing that I think that's really interesting, Chrissy, is that there's many autistic people that still mask their autism yeah and they mask it and and try very very hard to fit in and look neurotypical because they think well if i show my autism or if people see my autism then i am going to be um ostracized and i'm going to be judged and 
when I think about that, and I say this in the book too, I think that we forget as a majority that the minority are struggling because they are trying so desperately to fit in. But if they have to fit in by acting like the majority, then I'm not, I'm, that's not a good way to go. You no. know, it's, it's, and you know, when I think about it, I think about people who at one point in history, and it's probably the uh, people who still do that because of their sexual orientation, mm. had to pretend to be heterosexual. Um, I think about people that even our own Aboriginal community, you know, there were so many people that at certain points would not even be able to say, I am an Indigenous Australian. They would have said, oh, no, tell everybody that you're of Indian descent or Arabic descent or something because you see what I mean? Yeah. So I think that we have to be very, very careful that we make sure that when we're talking about minority groups as a majority me as a neurotypical person i'm very very conscious that i don't speak for that person yes. i'm not their voice i'm just trying to challenge my people the neuro- neurotypical people to go come on have a better look at yourself i know that that is a a, a common feature with autism with people with autism yeah. is that they think that if people can see who they really are then they won't be accepted and they they won't yeah. be um yeah they, they won't be liked and yeah. I, I noticed that in your book and I believe that is a universal human element. And even though someone with autism would feel that it is uniquely theirs, I think if we can all get our head around that element, then I think we'll all understand each other a whole lot better. Yeah. We are very judgmental. Mm. We are hugely judgmental mm. and, and we do try and conform a lot. We don't want to stand out. It is, and I always say, it's the brave. You know, we always go, dance like nobody's watching. Yeah. yeah. But if you're the person that's out there dancing, if you're going to be the first one on the dance floor, if you're going to be the person that cracks into a dance out in the middle of the street and everybody's watching you, you know, that's the brave. Yeah. The brave are the people that can be authentically themselves yeah. because the large majority of us are not that brave. No. We're not the one that gets up on the dance floor first. We're definitely not the one that, you know, breaks into a bit of the <laughs> Yeah, a dance absolutely. The traffic lights. We don't. So to be authentically you, I think, is one of the boldest, bravest things that people can do. I absolutely agree. I wanted to ask, you just mentioned historically, um, you know, people that were gay had to hide their sexuality and, and all that sort of stuff. And given that our kind of knowledge of autism and neurodivergency and all that is reasonably new, mm. what did society do or call people with autism, Yeah, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Yeah. So the first person that actually coined the phrase autism mm. was this fella called Canner in, in the 1940s. Mm-hmm. And and what he he was working at that point, you can imagine if people were institutionalised, they were living in institutions. And so this guy, Canner, saw a group of boys that had been young boys who'd been... So he was able to kind of coin this phrase because he could study a group of young people. So that's what and, families did. They had a child that had this disability and they sent them away. Well, before the 1990s, every single person that had a diagnosis of autism had an intellectual disability. So it wasn't until the 1990s that then the diagnostic manual said, oh, hang on, we've also got this thing called Asperger's. Asperger's only came into realisation in the 1990s. So prior to that, to, if you were autistic, you had an intellectual disability. And then in the 1990s, they said there was a new thing that was called Asperger's, mm. and Asperger's were people who were autistic, but they didn't have an intellectual disability. Yeah. So what we started recognising Quite the opposite, is, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could be average to very, very bright, but yeah. you could still have difficulty with social interaction mm. And the way that you kind of thought, you know, the way your thought processes worked. So then, so in my time, I've seen the diagnosis change. Well, I call it three and a half times, three times diagnostically change and revised once. So it was only in 2013 that Asperger's was then dropped 
And then everybody um, was autistic. And so the language has shifted and changed, you know, so many times and culturally it shifted and changed as mm. well. So people were autistic, oh, that person's autistic. And then pers first, for person first language came into being. So then it was person with autism spectrum disorder or person on the spectrum or, yeah. you know, and then it was person with autism. And now it's swinging back around again because now it's culturally the autistic community have taken on this deep pride and said, hang on, now I'm an autistic person. So it's shifted back to identity first language. Right. So co there's always cultural shifts, you know, and I, I don't know where it will be in another 30 years time. Maybe we won't have anything called autism. Maybe it will just be people are just neurodiverse and that will just be how it is. Yeah. But. Yeah, that, that shifts and changes all the time. And so I've watched it. The language change, the diagnosis change, the culture of autism change, the culture of disability change. So, you know, when you're an old person, you get to see that. <laughs> you get to see these shifts. But, uh, yeah, originally when I first started working in the 80s, we just said, oh, yeah, they're an autistic person. And now it swung right back around again. Yeah, right. And now we say autistic person again. Jody, can you tell us the story of Luna? Yes, I can tell you the story. So Luna was the first autistic person I ever met in my life. And I was 18 and had just started uni and I was getting it. I always wanted to work with people with disabilities, but I wasn't really great in school. And so um, I got into uni on a conditional entry, I got into uni conditionally. If I behaved myself and did well in the first year, I could stay. <laughs> so I was I was doing a teaching degree and I got a part-time job or a casual job as a disability support worker. So it, in those days, well, well, still now, you know, I was sent out to hang out with or people with a wide range of disabilities. But Luna was... I think she was six or seven. She was living, see, same thing, Chrissy. This, well, I'm talking 1980s. This is before what we call deinstitutionalisation. So Luna at six or seven was living in a residential care facility. She was already living in, uh, I think there was about 10 people that lived in the home that she lived in. And it was in a, a big area where I think there was about four or five of these different buildings. At six about, years old. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's, but you wouldn't, these days things would be done differently, but we didn't provide the support in families' yeah. homes like we do now. Mm. But I didn't even know what autism was. I'd never even heard of it. I think, I think I might've heard of it on the telly or, you know, something like that, but mm. really had no, I was 18. I was not a highly intelligent individual. <laughs> and so all they told me when I met Luna was that she didn't speak, so she was non-speaking, um, that she had a thing called autism. And the only other thing they said to me was that she liked water. And so do I. I absolutely love it. Like if I'm not in water every day, I'm, there's a problem. Even if it's just, you know, sticking my head under the shower, yeah. I have to get in there. So I just thought, oh, we'll take Luna swimming because that would be and there was this pool at the place where we were. I had picked Luna up on a weekend and there was a hydrotherapy pool that was attached to a back of a school that nobody was using. So I basically got permission to use this pool and it would be just be the two of us. We'd go, I'd pick her up, we'd drive to this pool and then we'd hang out in the pool together. But that makes it sound beautiful. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. The first day I picked Luna up, remember I had no idea what autism was at all and I'd never hung out with anybody that didn't communicate through speech ever in my life and the first day I picked Luna up she screamed for the whole time I was with her she she screamed the moment I, I opened the door the moment trying to get her into the car and I'm not talking just screaming Chrissy I'm talking you know when you see the kids and they're having they they screaming so much they sweat yes and they thrash yes and their bodies uh, you know she just was ha she was completely lost it and i had no idea what i was doing in any shape or form so she screamed the entire way from the residential care home that she lived in to the pool and then finally 
when we got to this pool, I opened, <laughs> opened the door. I'm laughing because it was like bang, bang <laughs> something completely changed. I opened the door and as soon as I opened the door, Luna stopped screaming. But then she licked, I'm talking, licked every single surface of this whole environment. And I'm talking about a little pool, a really hot, humid, yeah. sweaty, chlorine-filled pool that lots of people would have been in she licked the bricks she licked the tiles she licked the handrail she licked she licked the pool cover like she licked the door handle so what what was what was that about is that her way of well i didn't really understand yeah i didn't really understand to start with because this would happen for weeks and i'd try really really hard to interact with her as we would any six or seven Mm. year old try and speak to her and play with her and she'd just scream all the time Mm. And then after several weeks, I'm talking several, could have been a couple of months, one day I was just really, well, one, I was 18, so I was pretty bored because it was three hours together with her not talking to me and her screaming if I tried to talk to her. And mm. and then I just thought one day, I'm just going to do what Luna does. So every single thing that Luna licked, I licked too. I just copied what she did. So part of it was just curiosity, part of it was boredom, and it was like this huge moment that opened up in my little 18-year-old brain that just thought what happened was I realised how much we actually take on with our, our mouth and our tongue. So, you know, little kids, they mouth objects you know you give them yes. something and they immediately put it in their mouth because mm. they're trying to get more sensation mm. and trying to get more information they're trying to make sense of it yeah yeah and and this is why humans kiss yeah that's that's what i've also realized in my lifetime that that we pick up a lot of information with our mouths and our tongues and and it's got deep sensory stuff going on in there mm. so basically i just did what luna did and it, it taught me so much in that moment of just going oh i get it she's just experiencing the world in such a different way and that i was trying to force luna to do it my way yeah when actual fact she was just doing it in a completely different way and once i understood the way that she was moving through the world our relationship completely changed because i just stopped i stopped talking I stopped making her do it my way. I stopped making her try and play with me. I stopped trying to make her interact with me. So if she just wanted to lick the world, go for it. And, yeah, the the final part of that book was that chapter was that the most beautiful thing happened. And remember, I was very, very young when this happened. But once I gave over to stop doing it the Jody Rogers way, the Jody Rogers always gets it right, mm-hmm. Once I stopped doing that, there was, you know, a few months into us just not talking to each other, just hanging out in the pool. She came up and she licked me. She licked my arm. And it was this most amazing thing because in that moment, I realised that she had, she was communicating with me. She was communicating with me in the way that she interacts with the world. And by licking me, she was saying, I'm connected with you. You're here. We're here in this together. And, yeah, it just it shifted everything about my understanding of humans in that moment. Well, I mean, there was many, many years. I'm still learning. No yeah. one's an expert in humans. But, you know, it was something as a young person, it was the first point that I realised that it didn't have to be on my terms. It, it, it was much more about me leaning into other people's way. I, I love that story. Because I think there's a lesson in that for everybody that lives with another human being or interacts with another human being, any sort of human being. And if you can apply that kind of philosophy to a partner or a child and stop trying to get them to live life the way that you're living it, if you stop and listen and watch and really notice how they move through the world, how they communicate, what makes them comfortable, and you adapt to that, life is more beautiful and meaningful for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We've got very high expectations, don't you reckon? Like even 
we have an expectation that everybody will understand us and yes. everybody will do it our way. We assume. Or, we assume yeah, that we should, everybody's yeah. wired the same way we are and it's not yeah. true. No, definitely not true. And it, that's exactly it. When I think about compromise, and this is what it is, you know, we all walk through the world experiencing this in our own well, that's why it's called unique, you know, in our own unique way, the way mm. that I perceive the world, the way that I communicate, mm. what I think is, you know, should do it this way or mm. the way that I want things done is very different the way than you that you do. But if I want you, if I expect you, Chrissy, to do it my way, then that's not me compromising. There's no negotiation. There's no middle. There's no common ground with that. That's just me going my way, do it my way. Humans aren't meant to do that. We're meant to find the middle space together. So I should be leaning towards you and you lean towards me. And if we lean into each other, then that's when the relations, that's when the deepest connections happen. Agree. When, and, I, and I love what you just said then about really listening because one of my all-time favourite sayings is listen like a sponge. And oh, I do mine this. is listen, really listen. Is it? Yeah. That's see. Oh, you, you, well, you and I like this. <laughs> but I, I often do it at my, at my work because as a counsellor and a therapist, sometimes what's going on in your head, people will be um, talking to me and telling me a story and sometimes I find my brain's really, really racing mm. with, oh, you should do this or you should do that or you should do this or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all, my brain's already thinking about the Jody perspective. So sometimes I, I snap myself out of it and just yeah. go, listen, like, a sponge mm. because what a sponge does it just absorbs it it just goes take it in listen to everything without any expectation yeah every drop get in. yeah just take it in just take all and listen really carefully yeah and listen that you know i think that's the most important thing that we can do most of us are terrible at listening we really are. We're really terrible. I agree. I was just going to say it's it's a skill that you really do need to learn because I actually learnt to listen, really listen when I started in radio oh. because otherwise there's no point talking to anybody for broadcast Yeah. because they're just talking and you're thinking of what you're going to say next Yeah. and there's no... There's nothing meaningful that's ever going to happen in that situation. Yeah. But when I learnt to listen, really listen, yeah. then the conversation can go in a, in a natural, curious way. Yeah. And you know how you said to me prior to us starting this recording, you know, about knowing the questions? Mm. Some, sometimes, well... Very rarely. I never want to know the questions because if I know the questions, then I'm going to come up with a scripted answer. And then what's going to happen is that you and I are not going to be communicating in a natural way. I'm not going to be really listening to your question yeah, and listening to what you have to say because it will already be scripted and I can understand why people need scripting because that's about an anxiety. Yes. And you know, when we script answers, it's about an anxiety that we need to kind of think, oh, what am I going to say because I'm, mm. I'm worried about what I'm saying. But I 100% agree with you. I, I think it's an incredible skill and this is why I think anybody that is a podcaster or a journalist or on radio, anyone who's an interviewer, I think it is one of the most incredible skills for people to just follow the natural course of where you're going and when they throw out an answer or we throw out a question, to really listen to the answer that somebody's doing. I couldn't do your job. There's no way I could do your oh, job. Jody, you absolutely no way. You do no. it all the time when you're <laughs> with clients. Yeah, but I've got a full, you know, I've got 50 minutes of me sitting there going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes I never have to answer, ask a question. I couldn't do what you do Jody, at you all. absolutely could. <laughs> but I tell you, you uh, you have some skills that I could never do. Let's move on to your other hat that you wear as a sexologist, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, a sexologist, I thought was a made-up term for somebody that was Randy. (laughs) (laughs) 
turns out that no, you've gone to university. A sexologist goes to university for years. You've got a master's yes. in this. Yeah, I do. So some people call some people call themselves sex therapists. Yeah. But I call myself a sexologist. You know, mm. but it's it's the same terminology. But basically, if you think about, you know, a biologist has studied biology. Mm. A psychologist has studied psychology. A sexologist has studied sexuality, and so it's the same. It's the same thing. So yeah, it's a it's a master's degree. You study human sexuality, and you study it as a specialisation so that you can um, work as a therapist helping people with all areas of their sexuality. See, I cannot be my- alone in my original definition in my mind that I had completely made up on my own that a sexologist is like I thought for years that a sexologist was an expert in what positions are best for people (laughs) there are sex therapists that do that there are sex therapists that that will help people with all of that. And that that's one area of human sexuality is sort of talking to people about that area of intimacy. You've got to remember human sexuality is so broad mm. and so big. And um, so, you know, when I think about it, when people go, what, what does a sexologist actually do? Well, I usually start from going, okay, well, the very first moment that most humans are birthed into the world, one of the first words that they hear will be sex. What sex are they? And so, like our little ears are hearing it. They're probably, even before you drove, people do these bloody, you know, gender reveals. That, what sex is it? You know, we're, we're, so mm. our sex is our biological sex. It's our gender. It's our, so, and, you know, then we have to talk about some people are intersex as well so you know that's our part of our biology it's where we are with our masculinity and femininity it starts from sort of that area and then we've got our sensuality and our expression of sexuality and our sexual orientation and our and what people fantasize about Mm. sexual function and dysfunction and decision making about all these components it's it is huge chrissy and in my world it can also be because what i do is that I take all of these complex areas of human sexuality and decision-making around human sexuality and around relationships, and I make this information accessible for people with cognitive disability and autistic people and people with acquired brain injury or people who are struggling with their sexuality in some way. So some people may not know that certain areas of um, mental health and mental illness can present with a lot of hypersexuality yeah. or that, you know, what, you know, one of the most amazing things for women as well, and I'm talking biological women, is that when a woman orgasms, it completely allows our central nervous systems to just calm down because we've used all this energy up with it, you know, post orgasm that checks so there's out a lot of that checks out <laughs> but so if somebody's really just can you imagine if somebody is in a manic state with their mental health they're really really manic there's some people that just go well this is one of the only ways that it really helps me to mm. actually calm my sexual nervous system so i don't think that's one area of my work I'm, i i talk sexuality in relationships all day long but what i'm trying to do is help and support people to have information about sexuality and relationships in a way that they understand Mm. that matches what they're experiencing and what they're going through. And so, you know, there's sex therapists and sexologists that their main area of work is working with um, couples that may be struggling with sexual dysfunction Mm. or they may be working with people that have Um, you know, arousal dysfunction Mm. or have difficulties with orgasm or have, you know, if you were talking about males, they might have erectile dysfunction. So there's people that do that kind of work all the time. Can I ask ask a, a broad question about sexuality and psychology? Yeah. Does the, for example, I've never been interested in, 
the the wham bam thank you ma'am you know lots and lots of and I, I don't judge anybody that loves that but it just has never appealed to me mm. can somebody's personality and psychology and who they are day to day affect mm. the person that they are sexually are they very connected the word that was interesting there for me so i just went into immediately right let me just pull right there the <laughs> word was a <laughs> the word was effect so i'd say to you that that the way that people experience their sexuality and their sensuality and their way that they like to it, you know their intimate relationships with other people is very very diverse so you know there's certain people that would say I I just love getting off and it, and you know that's they've got a really really high libido in terms of getting off mm. there's other people that may never feel arousal unless they first got really deep connection intimate connection vulnerable connection yeah, and it's that right. kind of connection that allows them to feel really sexual because then they're comfortable and with that level of comfort with that other person I'm talking you know intimacy is that is that connection comfort then that then represents itself in the, in kind of a physical intimacy with somebody else everybody's different it's such a drag though jody i wish i was the sort of person <laughs> that could just just do it you know but i've just i've got to feel so much it's got, like a, it's got to mean something or it's not i'd rather just have a cup of tea but that's fine well, it sounds really fine. because I'm getting old. So, what when you're saying that, it's much more about your relationship with the with the person that you're with. If you're in a committed relationship, then then that's a negotiation that you obviously have with that person. The difficulty would be if you're now saying, "Oh, well, I'm going to go. I have to go out and meet people." Yeah. But for me to meet people, I want to be at a level of comfort before this intimacy happens. Everybody's different. It's whether you're satisfied, if you're feeling okay, if you're, you know, there's no, people always go, you know, am I normal? You know, this normal that everybody talks yeah. about. Yeah. Um, what, what's the normal amount that people have sex? And what's the normal amount that people have sex for? And That's interesting to hear you use that term because I, uh, a few years ago, I started seeing a psychologist for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to do it. Um, <laughs> You know, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do with a stranger who didn't know me. Obviously, I had some things I needed to work through, but I, it felt very strange. And every sentence I would say to him by way of introducing him to my lady madness was, yeah. is it normal to, yeah. and then I would, you know, finish the sentence. And without exception, the answer was yes. Everything I yeah. was doing that I thought was utterly bonkers, all the yeah. thoughts I had kept to myself about what I wanted and what I dreamed of and what I thought was fair versus what was happening, everything that I would say, he would say, yeah, that's, that's absolutely normal. So everything that someone says to you in your capacity of a sexologist is normal well the, what what we try and do is always it's like what we're talking about before the first thing is that you give permission you give permission for people just to talk mm. because what happens is when you're in the position of your psychologist or in my position then everything becomes normal because yeah. what you realize is that we're all moving through the world with these funny thoughts that are going inside of our heads what i realize is that human sexuality is so diverse as well mm. it is incredibly diverse so you know i sit, have to i listen to people's um fantasies i listen to you know i work with people that are really involved with the kink community or that they may have fetishes or they have paraphilias none of this is an issue none of this is a problem the only time it's ever a problem is if it's impacting on that person's life or if it's impacting on another person's life, if it is illegal, if it is something that is harming to self or harming to other, yeah. then it is a, then it is a problem. When I'm talking harming to self, that can also be if the thoughts that are inside of your head are causing you distress. Yeah. But 
what humans we have the wildest thoughts going on yeah. all the time but Isn't sometimes it what happens, it's so great but you're exactly right there is no there is no normal every single person is different and all it's the only thing that's important is that what you are living is okay for you so if you said to me jody i'm not really into sex i prefer to have a cup of tea well are you happy with yourself with that yep well good on you that's great you know, and these people who are asexual, they never have any sense of sexual arousal. The thought of, if I said to somebody, oh, I thought, of, what about having sex with somebody? They'd be like, yeah. no way. I never want to do that. I, never I think we've had. all had those. I think we've all had those phases, <laughs> Jody. So there's, the only thing that's important is, is it okay for you? And if you're in a partnered relationship, is it something that you and your partner together uh, can you know is it okay for both of you because that's when the struggle can sometimes happen mm. that if that and that gets back to the expectations that we're talking about as well you know if you've got one person that says actually i really like just having a cuddle on the couch and a date night and a cup of tea and then having sex on a saturday night mm. in the same position with the lights off that's enough if you're both into that Great. It's the difficulty which comes when one person desires more, one person, to, and you know, you have mismatch interactions with things. And we've come full circle back to listen, really listen, because, yep. you know, from what I can gather from my friends and, you know, relationships that I can see, it's a really difficult thing to talk about. I think that that's the thing that most people, we're, we're the world is becoming more sexual, if that makes sense. Like I could get onto TikTok any day and go, oh, geez, look at all those sex aids and look what's happening out there. But do you know what I find? I mean, by the way, I... they should, a little vibrator should be sent to every woman on her 40th birthday <laughs> from the government. I think we should just have that as a big, so I might get it as a bumper sticker and start. Putting Honestly, my, I had no idea. The joy. <laughs> and then my friend that, just sent me one unannounced. And I have returned the favour many times, Jody, to my friends. That's great. A little Look anonymous package. Yeah, it's perfect. But this is this is the thing that that people are talking more about it with each other, or girlfriends are talking more with each other in that situation. Yeah. Or it's more you know, when I, I always say that when I first went to university to do my master's, there was only about 12 of us. Well, I'm talking a long time ago, about 20 years ago. Mm. There was about, the very we were the very first year that went through and I think there might have been 20 of us going, right, I really want to learn about human sexuality. Well, now there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Was that university stuff. course like behind the scenes of Hair the Musical? You're yeah, all you learning all this saucy stuff and you're young and... I know people think it's saucy, but we also had started with anatomy and physiology. We also had to learn like the anatomy and physiology of the sexual organs and reproductive organs. You know, we had to be able to name. We had to understand exactly what the um, the hormones and what you know why it was that the gonads what changed within a gonad of a, a somebody in utero to become either male or female or intersex so we're sorry i'm size. still i'm still like 10 years old hearing the word <laughs> gonads makes me laugh it's part of the anatomy i know i know it's, it's always so funny even at school when uh, when you know kiki ki, oh it's an erection <laughs> um, but, but you know that that's it's for me do you know one of the greatest things i was just talking to somebody about this the other day probably one of the greatest things getting back to what we're talking about as well mm. one of the most brilliant things that happened in that course is that, that we were highly challenged with our own attitudinal value about human sexuality mm. so they you and they would layer it so they might say you know, they they give us an example of somebody and their type of sexuality and then they would layer on something else and layer on something else and layer to get to see how far, when was the moment that you as a therapist would just go, no, I can't, I can't hear that. Because, you know, if I have somebody come in to see me. What are some examples have, of those layers that you're talking about? Um, so we might have somebody that we start talking about different types of paraphilia, you know, somebody. What's paraphilia? Got, uh, 
So, you know, like it can be like a fetish, like a foot fetish. Okay. So, you know, a sexual objectification of a certain part of the body. Or would you be okay talking to somebody that was into that they were into wearing nappies, Mm -hmm. them wearing nappies themselves? Or what about if somebody... um, Have they done a poo in the nappy? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you be... So layering on top of that, Uh you know. So what they do is they keep layering on top of how what was people's different sexual expression what was your what cut off you cut- um i haven't found a cut off yet haven't there's you? there's things that make me this well i work with some people that have got offending behavior and have been incarcerated and for different types but most people that i work like with, with dead with- people or dead things or animals? Oh, no, 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 no. no. Oh, yeah, to bestiality, definitely. But you've got to remember that we're also living in a community where people are very highly exposed to a lot of pornography that is just clicking on things. And yeah. a lot of pornography is like the bigger, the better, the more, you know, it's like how many car chases and explosions can you get in porn. And so yeah. remember the community that I work with, many people have a cognitive disability many people are autistic and so they haven't even received very good comprehensive sexuality education in school or Mm. through family and so one of the number one sex educations that young people go to or people in general go to these days is porn yeah so they get exposed to a lot of things a lot of stuff and then if they're trying to understand that then these are conversations I'm having on a daily basis. Yeah, and they're conversations that every parent should be having with their children. I've got three kids and initially I was like, oh, I've got to have these conversations with my sons. I need to specifically tell them whatever because they're going to see it. They're going to yeah. see it no matter what controls you've got or whatever. They're, they're going to see it. Yeah. And, you know, I initially was like, I've really got to have these important conversations with these with these kids to tell them that that's not what it's like. It's like, you know, that is that is as much what sex is like as a an apocalyptic movie. Like that's never happened in real life. That's not what you can expect in, in real life. They are completely unrelated. And really we've got to tell our daughters as well. Yeah. Do you know one of the things I do at work I have got I've got this footage. I just get just you can get it on YouTube where I do. Let's look at ten minutes of Fast and the Furious. Yeah. So and I, and so I just put lots of the people. Why are we going to watch Fast and the Furious? Yeah, we're going to watch Fast and the Furious. Let's watch Fast and the Furious and let's work out what's real and what's not real. Mm. So you know, can can a car really come out of the back of a plane with a parachute and do this? Nah. So we go through all of that. And then I say, to, then I say, okay, well, when we're watching Fast and the Furious, if you were going to learn how to drive, do you reckon we should just give everybody Fast and the Furious to learn how to drive? Right. So if we're now thinking about porn. That's exactly what I was everybody... trying to say. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because it's about critical thinking. It's about trying to, and do you know what? I, what I've realised with many teenagers as well I mean, definitely the teenage brain is fired by reward and that there's a lot of stuff when you're watching pornography mm. that makes the body go, woohoo! Yeah. So then you want to do it again and again and again. But it's helping people to critically think. And teenagers also like to think that they're the really smart ones. Mm. So if you let them know that the porn industry is also selling them something and they know how to suck them in, it's just teaching people to critically... All of us need to critically think. We need yeah. to think about what we're being sold, what we're being told, where is this information coming from, what's the agenda of the person who's telling This is the listening again. I was you know, going to say behind. it's listen. Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> listen, listen behind, really but... listen. Yeah. 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 But I've got a ripper of a job because I talk about this stuff all day long oh, God. and particularly with people that are blunt and straightforward or quite complex for what's happening and mm. I have to take that information and get it into the simplest form humanly possible for somebody to be able to understand what is going on like i had to talk to a client just the other week about she came to see me and she she's in a complex relationship but she is bantered around all the time these words coercive control Mm. how do you explain that to somebody with an intellectual disability how do you explain 
you know, these parts of what we're all talking about in these toxic relationships. How do you explain that to somebody with Down syndrome? It, and it has to be done. It has to be done. But these are very, very complex things we talk about. So in how did you? Right? How did you break it down? In well, I do lots and lots of tricks. So you know, there's tr- tricks. Makes me sound like I'm amazing magician. <laughs> magician. But, yeah, I've got. Yeah. What did we pull a coercive control relationship out of my head? <laughs> you know, it's breaking things down into small parts. So first of all, it's looking at what's a good relationship look like. You know, what's part of a good relationship? But the, people don't realise too. If somebody says, "Oh, a good relationship is about respect," what's respect look like? What does disrespect look like? Because we, you know, we banter these words around all the time. But I've got people that you know respect. They might say, "Oh, respect is about." Um, taking your dishes to the sink and saying please and thank you. Yeah, but what about all the other parts of respect? You know, so it's it's really taking these big concepts and bringing it back to day to day reality. How does somebody else on this planet show you respect? Because mm. we can't just use the word respect. What does respect look like? in our day-to-day interactions and what does disrespect look like? You would have got and some beautiful answers in your time. I think I could be one of the luckiest humans in the world because I get to people that I work with ask the best questions and they ask the questions that the most of us are thinking about but we never ask them. Yeah, and because you're listening, really listening, you don't miss any of the beauty. No, and then I had spent a lot of time pondering and going, oh, how am I going to answer this? How am I going to explain this? How am I going to support this person? How am I going to put it in a way that they can comprehend? How am I going to put it in a way that is understandable for them? And that's different for every person. And that is true for any person, whether or not they're on the spectrum or not. Now, Jodie Rogers, I'm holding up a photograph. (laughs) of a tiny, gorgeous, bright little girl. This is you. How old are you here? Uh, Five. I'm about five there. Look at that haircut. My dad used to cut our hair. Oh, gee, you can't tell. (laughs) And you know the funny thing? So this is probably why I've never had a fringe. Did he use a fork? (laughs) Do you know he used to pay us? He used to say, I'll pay you. To cut our hair so that we didn't have to go to the hairdresser. That is fantastic. Yeah. What did Jody? What what sort of person was Jody, and how far away from this kid are you now? I was quite an introverted little kid. I was. I, I spent a lot of time. I was. Yeah, I was the member of the family. I'd hide behind my mum's. You know, I was scared mm. to go to school. I was scared to enter spaces. I spent mm. a lot of time drawing. I was very much in my imagination. Right. I spent a lot of time in my imagination. I don't know what shifted for me to become so extroverted and to feel so comfortable in my own skin. I don't know. I don't know when that shift happened. But when you hold up that picture, Chrissy, yeah. when you hold it up, what I do know that hasn't changed is I I can see that kid is very sparkly. I can see that that kid's gone. This is all great. Yeah. And that hasn't changed. I think that we, I I think life is so fabulous. I think that I just love it. I love being alive and I love living and that hasn't changed. That sparkly eyed little kid, I can still feel her. Do you think maybe you were quiet for a few years because you were working stuff out? You were just taking it all in and understanding people and your place in the world and then when you knew bang off you went maybe maybe that I I did I think you know that funny old Maya Briggs thing they used to do this kind of personality thing yeah they say you're extroverted or introverted Mm. sometimes when I've done that test in the past I've come out as both both extroverted and introverted me too do you really yeah so what do you what do you identify as? I think I think it, I think I'd have to say I'm extroverted because people fill me up. So you know when I always think about extroverted as an introverted, not so much of the way we move through the world, but what actually f- 
charges our batteries. Yeah, well, and isn't so, that the definition? An introvert gets yeah. energy from within and an extrovert gets energy yeah. from without. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I definitely know I draw a lot of energy from other people. but And I think the introverted part of me is the fact that I quite like, I, I love reflection. Mm. I love having time to just ponder, but that's not what fills me. It's the people that fill me. But, yeah, maybe as a little kid, I was just kind of really voyeuristically going, what is going on? Yeah. And then, yeah, once I sort of, once I felt it within my own skin, and, and that's not to say that I haven't had massive self-esteem issues in my lifetime, because I think we all do. We all have difficulty with self-esteem, but I think that as this is the beauty of getting older. Mm. The beauty of getting older is that I want to be that person that is dancing in the street. I really want to be that person. I want to be that person that is no matter where I go, just feel so authentically just to be me. Yeah. And, and that I will keep trying and striving to be that person for as long as I live. I want to be the person that works. They go, yeah, look at her dancing like nobody's watching. <laughs> I think, I'd love- you know, you are testament to listen, really listen to yourself as well and then you That's can't go true. wrong. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's a really good one. I've never even thought about that. But see, thank you for being my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the bill, Jodie Rogers. Thank you so much for joining me. You really are a sparkly delight and I've just loved talking to you you're a gem thank you i do i feel like i'm when when i met you the other day and I, I really just felt like i'd met a kindred spirit in the world and that's a beautiful thing i felt that too so thank Isn't you it so wonderful? much yeah thank you so much for and thanks for asking me to be on the podcast i'm so delighted to be able to talk to oh you were top of the list and i'm going to come to your place <laughs> for a cup of tea and talk more about sex and stuff You are welcome. My door is always open for you. I love it. You're going to regret you said that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, that was a wild ride. And the biggest takeout for me in that chat is that I want Jodie Rogers on Speed Dials to talk all things spectrum and sauciness. Her curiosity and open-heartedness is palpable. I just love her. I want to kiss her all over. Follow Jodie on Insta at Jodie Rogers. That's Rogers with a D and a G, where you'll also find a link in bio to get her book, Unique, What Autism Can Teach Us About Difference, Connection and Belonging. Really powerful, beautiful stuff. Now, have you sent me a voice message yet to my Insta page at the Chrissy Cast? What is on your mind? What did you have for dinner? Do I need to have soy milk here for the next time you come over? Let me know. If you don't ask, you don't get. Now, next episode drops in just a few days and I have cleaned the sliding door window in preparation. That's how you know it's big. See you back here then, Chrissy Casters.